that is where propaganda comes in. And, and there are two levels of propaganda. There's the propaganda which is intended for the broader public, which will, which will now uphold nuclear weapons as maybe something which could be used and so on, and we use it first and we protect ourselves against Kim Jong-un who wants to blow up the world. You know, that is the kind of discourse we have. And of course, nobody in the media will say that, that uh, North Korea lost up to 30% of its population during US bombings, okay? That, was, that is known and documented and it is acknowledged even by the, by the US military. Because you have the, st the statements of General Curtis LeMay, who said, uh, I can't imitate his accent, but he said, uh, we must have, we knocked down, what, 98% of their cities, and we must have killed, what, 20% of their population over a period of bombings. They admit 20%, okay? Now, is that a, a war, is that a crime against humanity? From, this, from the point of view of, of North Korea, who is, whose uh, national security is threatened? Theirs, okay? There's not a single family that doesn't have a member who was lost during that war. Now, uh, the, the question is that, that those realities, those extensive crimes against reality, will never be, uh, they, will, they will go into scholarly journals, they may, they may be discussed, but they will not be used as a, as, a, as, a, as a feature which might in any way undermine the nuclear weapons program of the United States of America and its allies, okay? And then, of course, they, they will say, ah, well, North Korea has, what, has 10, we don't know exactly how many they've got. But Belgium has more nuclear weapons than North Korea, so, and so does the Netherlands, and so does Italy. They're all they're non-declared nuclear weapon states. They're five European countries: um, Germany, Italy, um, Belgium, Holland, Turkey. Okay, the five non-declared nuclear weapons countries, which have tactical nuclear weapons made in America, but under national command, which qualifies them as nuclear weapon states, undeclared nuclear weapon states. The whole thing is trivialized. Turkey has about 50 of those bombs, okay? It can blow up the planet as well, right from, uh, you know, you've got Erdogan and so on, he might blow up the planet, who knows? No, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm just saying, we're, we're look, we're, we have such a level of disinformation and double standards that we can't even identify uh, who, uh, which country constitutes a threat. Israel has 400 nuclear weapons, strategic. They can blow up the, the planet as well. And, um, and of course, when religion is combined with, these, with, with the nuclear doctrine, it becomes even more, more serious. And, and there are lots of testimonies in, in that regard. Now, uh, what I'm... Uh, what I, I think is very important, uh, I don't think we, we have, um, we don't have necessarily the abilities to, to, to establish a new um, world order with social justice and so on and so forth. I, that's, that's certainly something which is, is a longer term objective. But our objective is ultimately to prevent the destruction of what we already have, and and uh, and to safeguard humanity. Now there there was a campaign, uh, which uh, as as you might recall, it's the campaign against uh, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, which uh, received the Nobel Prize uh, this year. No, last year, um, uh, and um, uh, it was submitted to a vote of the General Assembly. That was last year or the year before, I think in 2016. And how did the media report on that important initiative? Okay. They uh, said that the nuclear weapon states uh, voted against and there were abstentions by some other countries 
what they didn't mention, and that's where lies come in, is that among the declared nuclear weapon states, the only country that voted in, voted in favor was North Korea. Okay? It was not on, when they, they, they simply, said, they listed the countries, they included North Korea, they said United States, United States, uh, Britain, France, uh, Russia, China, North Korea, Pakistan, India, Israel voted against. Not true. North Korea voted against. China, uh, Pakistan, and India abstained. Very, Russia voted against. Okay? Russia could have abstained as well. This was, this was on the, on the part of North Korea, this was a commitment to ultimately eliminating nuclear weapons. It doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to give them up unconditionally, but uh, it does intimate the fact that the North Korean leadership took the decision to vote against uh, nuclear weapons and to support the initiative which got the Nobel Prize. But there's not a single newspaper which has acknowledged that. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was a report in the, in the Canadian media, Ottawa's a citizen which I follow, and the, the report of the Ottawa citizen indicated exactly what I, I mentioned. They listed the countries, and then a reader wrote a note and said, you're mistaken. And then the Ottawa citizen simply made a rectification. Yes, North Korea voted against. Okay, but it's a, it's a fundamental uh, position, and it it shows how um, the media contributes to misinformation or omission. In this case, it was outright lying. That nobody makes a mistake of that nature. You consult the the UN vote of the of the General Assembly. If you're a journalist. You do your job and you acknowledge what happens. And omitting that particular uh, vote of the, of the DPRK is tantamount to disinformation and propaganda. Okay? I mean, there are many other cases of, of propaganda. Uh, let me go back to 1945. Because that's where propaganda comes in. Now, I... I strongly suggest that if you have time uh, have a have a look at Truman's diary uh, on the 9th on the 9th of August 1945 uh, Truman came back from the Potsdam negotiations and made a, a radio speech, which was quite long, but he acknowledged the fact that, um, I should mention that 9th of August 1945 was when the second bomb was, was dropped on Nagasaki. But in, the, in the, his statement, in his radio statement on, on the 9th of August 1945, he said, I quote, the world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. And that was because we wanted to save the lives of innocent civilians." Unquote. Now, any, anybody who is an honest journalist will say that's fake, right? That's fake news. To say that Hiroshima is a military base. It's not a military base. It's a large city which was wiped out in seven seconds. But there's a lot more to the discourse. Um, I, I, I'd like to introduce at this point another historical element which is very, very crucial in the understanding of, of nuclear weapons. On the 15th of September 1945, on the 15th of September 1945, the United, uh, the U.S. Um, military uh, 
released uh, a document which it was, a, it was a secret document which was then declassified because that's what we get some 20 years later, no, some half a century later we, we have access to that document but it it's only, has only been recently released, okay? But uh, let me uh, give you details of that very important document. Um, on the 15th of September 1945, at a time when the United States and the Soviet Union were still allies, the United States issued a plan to bomb something of the order of wait a minute. Very good on this version, but um, yeah, I, I um, uh, well, it, it, in effect, uh, that's it. Uh, okay, they were to bomb um, essentially all cities of the Soviet Union with 204 atomic bombs. Okay, 204 atomic bombs, and it was a project to wipe the Soviet Union off the map. Okay? Now, that project was first formulated as early as 1942 under what is called the Manhattan Project. Now, the Manhattan Project, that's where you see all the ironies of, of, uh, of, of the history of war. That the Manhattan Project was formulated, was launched in 1939 at a time when the United States was not at war with anybody. Okay? They were not at war with Germany. They, they, were, they, they were at war with Germany as of 1941 after Pearl Harbor. So that the, the, the 1939, you have the Manhattan Project, and the main participants of the Manhattan Project were the United States, Britain and Canada. And the reason Canada was involved uh, is that we unfortunately have large supplies of, of uranium uh, in, in Western Canada, the province of Saskatchewan. So that this was, was really the input. But this was a secret project. The Manhattan Project was a secret project. And I uh, verified that the plan to blow up the Soviet Union not Nazi Germany, not Nazi Germany. The plan to blow up the Soviet Union goes back to 1942. So as of 1942, when the United States and the Soviet Union were allies fighting Nazi Germany, there was already a plan to blow up the Soviet Union, which was confirmed in official documents, which are now <coughs> declassified, and, and, uh, and uh, I mean, it's, it's so, uh, so precise in, 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 in its statements, uh, 66 major cities. And then they itemized them in, in terms of, of the, actual, you know, the, the actual number of bombs they need. Uh, they might need three or four nuclear bombs for Moscow and, and Leningrad, and then a lesser number of bombs if they're bombing Rostov, and so on and so forth, but they have scan the whole geographic landscape of the Soviet Union. And that was done on the 15th. The document was released on the 15th of September, 1945. Um, one month after Hiroshima. Barely one, yes, about a month after, after Hiroshima. Uh, and I should mention another thing. Uh, there is now ample evidence, uh, and it was known to U.S. policymakers, that uh, Hitler was opposed to the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, there are documents to that effect. There is no evidence that that Nazi Germany was involved in the. I'm not. That's not uh, an apology. I'm trying to make it. It's just fact. Okay. It's recorded fact that Nazi Germany uh, was not, it uh, was opposed to developing 
um, nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, that the, the, the reasons which are presented to us that the United States developed nuclear weapons to be used against Nazi Germany are false. They're false. And there's ample evidence that, in fact, the objective was to be used against the Soviet Union as of 1942. So we're not dealing with the Cold War. This is not a Cold War uh, nuclear race. It is something which emerged at a much earlier period. And for the history of nuclear war, that's absolutely essential. Without this Manhattan Project, there would be no nuclear weapons today. Because all subsequent um, developments which took place uh, by uh, the various nuclear weapons powers um, came as a result of an arms race. Uh, the Soviet Union developed nuclear capabilities. Uh, I think it was 1949 when they when they they announced that they had nuclear capabilities. Then the Chinese uh, started doing theirs as well. Why? Because uh, the Soviet Union was threatened, but China was also threatened. And China, incidentally, that's very interesting. China's, the People's Republic of China was, was founded in October, on the 1st of October, 1949, right? In January 1950, they were threatened with nuclear annihilation. Okay, alongside, uh, alongside North Korea. No? So at the outset of the Korean War, before the outset of the Korean War, there were threats directed against China, North Korea, and the Soviet Union, inevitably against countries which have an alternative um, economic system, right? economic and social system, whether we like it or not. But that, that was the objective. And it was to annihilate um, uh, whatever it was to annihilate those countries because they were not playing the game of global capitalism. Now, now, um, with regard to with regard to North Korea, as I mentioned, because ultimately. Um, I still want to relate this to some of the more recent developments because uh, what you see emerging in the media, uh, which is um, really the result of, of extensive propaganda, is that despite this, this history and despite the fact that the United States has has been seeking to establish a nuclear weapons monopoly with uh, capabilities which are sufficient to blow up the planet several times. That's not an understatement. They have 4,000 nuclear weapons deployed. They have a $1.2 trillion nuclear weapons program, and so on and so forth. And they have privatized the nuclear weapons industry. Now, let me just mention another element which is, uh, which is crucial. In, on August 6th to 9th, 2003, and bear in mind the chronology, the, the, the nuclear posture review of the Bush administration was formulated already in 2001. It was adopted in 2002 by the Senate. And then a year later, in August 6 to 9, 2003, the nuclear weapons industry, together with the Pentagon, intelligence apparatus, think tanks, and so on, meet in a secret, this was a secret meeting in the headquarters of uh, U.S. Strategic Command uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, for people who have seen the, the, the movie with Peter Sellers, you know, where, where uh, this was, where they were planning nuclear war, etc., etc. It's in that building, okay? The, so they meet privately. Now, 
the, the irony is that they are commemorating these people who are, in fact, the protagonists of nuclear war, are commemorating the crimes of August 6 and August and August 9, 1945. Okay? August 6, August 9, they come in on August 6 and they depart on August 9. But these are not these are not NGOs, they're not anti-war people. They are people who are planning the nuclear weapons uh, for the future, which have now merged into the 1.3 trillion. Now, um, I, I have reported on that, I think, in my, in my earlier book. Um, and uh, it, it's absolutely crucial. There you have a, you have a meeting uh, with the, the contractors. Essentially what you're doing is privatizing. You're privatizing nuclear war. You're privatizing, the, well, you have the production, well, the Manhattan Project was not a private undertaking. It was a, it was a US government-sponsored project, okay? With, well, with, with it was state-supported. But uh, the, 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 the post-war period, the weapons are produced by private companies. But this particular secret meeting is very important because you are actually involving these private companies in the actual planning of nuclear war. Uh, you have the preemptive doctrine. Now, the preemptive doctrine to, to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states if they threaten you. Okay? Now, anybody can threaten. Iran is threatening the U.S. North Korea is threatening the U.S. Uh, who else is threatening the U.S.? Cuba is threatening the U.S. They can they can drum up a whole series of threats. They've never been invaded by anybody, as far as I know. And uh, they've invaded Canada um, several times. And they even had a plan to annex Canada, and they had a plan to invade Canada back in the 1930s. Can you imagine? Nobody in Canada knows about this. There was a military plan to invade Canada, formulated in, in, the, in the 1920s and 30s. And then it, it, was, it was scrapped um, shortly prior to World War II. And then they said, no, we're allies, you know. Well, the, Canada was a British colony, uh, uh, historically. But that's the kind of, the US has never been threatened by anybody, as far as I know. They, they've threatened how many countries around the world. But um, the, this preemptive notion of of, um, is, is a very, of course, it's a very dangerous concept, but it can only be sustained through propaganda. We're going to blow you up if you threaten us, okay? So Iran threatens, and then, oh, remember why, remember the, the concept which was presented some many years ago when they accused uh, Iran that was doing the the, the president is see of uh, Ahmadinejad, and Ahmadinejad made certain, certain statements and quoted, and he said, essentially he said, Israel be wiped off the map, okay? And then they were accusing Iran of, uh, of uh, a plan to wipe Israel off the map, okay? But that plan was never existed. Um, and uh, it was it was well. I, I won't get into the into the into the details of that. But the, the propaganda campaign is that Israel was being threatened and that Iran wanted to wipe it off the map. And for that not to occur, we have to to attack Iran and destroy it with nuclear weapons. Which of course Israel has 400, so there's no problem there. Um, so again. All this history is, is obfuscated by media reports, by academics. Uh, the, the secret agreement which, uh, which was held in, uh, uh, in Nebraska, I'll, I'll read you a section of this because it's so revealing. Um,
I'm sorry I lost this quotation, so uh, we'll have to uh, So uh, essentially what has happened in the, in the post-Cold War period um, and also again 2001 which is, which is a watershed is that the doctrine of mutually assured destruction which prevailed during the Cold War which was very much uh, understood by both by the Soviet Union and uh, the United States, and which was the object of diplomacy, if we think of the Cuban Missile Crisis 61-62, uh, where there was a, an understanding between um, uh, Nikolai Sergeyevich Khrushchev on the one hand and, and uh, JFK on the other. Uh, and uh, their objective was ultimately to avoid this confrontation because they understood that there was no out possible outcome, mutually assured destruction, uh, destruction MAD. Now, uh, that doctrine has been, has been scrapped. Uh, the, the mutually de assured destruction is still there but it's no longer a concept of negotiation or, or understanding of what nuclear weapons can do to you. And, and what has happened is that the safe for civilians doctrine has come in and the preemptive nuclear weapons uh, doctrine is what now prevails. There was preemptive warfare, uh, both in conventional warfare as well as in, in uh, strategic nuclear weapons, but, uh, but now uh, they have, they're pushing this notion, one, that the new generation of nuclear weapons are harmless, and secondly, they can be used on a preemptive basis. And, uh, and um, the mad doctrine has been replaced by madness, <laughs> so to speak. I, I mean, uh, if you look at, at the statements of U.S. policymakers, they are totally unaware of the consequences of their actions. And I, I think it is very important to emphasize that ultimately uh, mistakes are often the, the underlying causes of, of world history, determine the course of world history. And I, we shouldn't exclude uh, an understanding of those mistakes. There are two types of mistakes. There, there are mistakes which may be of a technical commu communications nature. And, and uh, um, I, I'll give you an example, but it's amply documented by, uh, by uh, Dr. Helen Caldecott, who is one of the leading authorities on nuclear weapons. I've been in touch with her recently and she documented how the people who are um, overseeing the nuclear weapons, active nuclear weapons stocks in military facilities, that sometimes these people are uh, drugged with LSD, okay, or they are drinking alcohol. Um, if if, if uh, Trump presses the button, they have the responsibility then to act upon the pressing of the button. And uh, I, I, I mean, they're psych many of these people are psychologically deranged. Uh, and one can understand why. But there were recent reports saying that, that they were drugging themselves. They're on LSD. But now, if you're on LSD, you might. You saw that report? Uh, no, but I mean, the end result is you might have hallucinations and uh, yeah, press the button with being instructed. Yeah. Now, the other form of mistake are political mistakes. Uh, Donald Trump has the foggiest idea of, of the impact of nuclear weapons. I don't think he's ever studied it. I don't think his advisors will necessarily brief him on that because it's not doesn't follow in line with the ideology of, of the military-industrial complex. And, um, and then uh, you have, uh, uh, so you have various levels of mistakes political mistakes which can occur uh, and uh, 
ultimately there's a chain of command, and that chain of command is very dif difficult to break from a military standpoint. People who, who are, you know, who are in the military understand that very, very clearly. Uh, so one should not, under any circumstances, trivialize um, the, you know, the, the dangers that we are facing today. And uh, somebody said to me, oh, you've been talking about the threat of nuclear war for, for so many years now. Uh, you really sound a little bit stupid. It hasn't happened, okay? Uh, well, can't, prove it. Well, of course. I can't prove it, but we will not be able to to uh, uh, to prove it once it happens uh, before it actually happens. Okay, I can prove that that the threat is real, and we have scientists who who can corroborate that the threat is real, but we cannot necessarily uh, uh, forecast uh, any kind of decision uh, which may be made uh, in relation to that. It is clear that under present conditions, with the Russia Gate affair, um, which is based on a, on a <coughs> propaganda process which has gone beyond bounds, um, anything is possible. Uh, and for, for those who have followed the, the, the Skripal affair and the Russia Gate, um, uh, the evolving Russia Gate uh, controversy, is it's clear that, well, first of all, the propaganda is very poorly undertaken because people no longer believe in it. Okay? The, the, the Skripal uh, father and daughter are recovering. They were fully recovered. Nobody has been killed except the cat. Now, the, the, the cat in their home was, was euthanized by the British authorities. There's no evidence of anybody being killed, and so on and so forth. Yet, 150 Russian diplomats have been excluded from the European Union. Now, uh, when uh, Israel bombs the Gaza Strip and extensively kills uh, and, and wounds thousands of people, how many Israeli diplomats have been excluded from the European Union? Zero. That is, but, so we're, we're on the verge of absurdity. We're accusing the Russians uh, of certain things which never happened, okay? And we're accusing the Russians of uh, infiltration and, uh, and manipulation of the U.S. Uh, elections uh, when there's absolutely no evidence to that effect and when the United States routinely intervenes in elections virtually all over the world. And, and, uh, and so, but that is the... That is the kind of consensus which is building up. Uh, and um, mind you, this is not recent. I uh, understand that today is, is a commemoration of the, of the, of the MH17 flight, which of course has, a, has an important bearing on, on Malaysia. And that, was, that whole process was fabricated. That whole process was fabricated. It's another dossier. Uh, and accusing Russia of having blown, down, blown up the, the, the Malaysian Airlines flight is absolute fabrication, okay? Uh, I looked at the documents, the documents which were published uh, by the OSC right at the beginning, uh, which were broadcast by the BBC and by, CB, uh, and by the Canadian Broadcasting Cooperation and based on testimonies, and they absolutely, the early uh, information, testimonies, and evidence denies the reports which are now being presented, and which I understand from which uh, M Malaysia has been tacitly excluded from uh, you know from the the logic of this of this investigation, which wants to pin it on Russia. Okay, but that's another topic. Um, I, I, uh, I, I have still uh, extensive uh, uh, material here. Um, I haven't really addressed the, the Korean issue. 
uh, which is evolving, um, which is unfolding, and which is very contradictory. I, I think that uh, the, the Singapore summit, uh, of course, I think established a very important personal relationship between the two leaders. That's important in, in the realm of diplomacy. But uh, I, was, I was not very optimistic right from the beginning. I was in South Korea on that week of the 12th of June. Uh, and I followed it very carefully, those negotiations. The thing is, is Trump is not involved in the negotiation. It's, uh, the lead negotiator is Pompeo. Mike Pompeo, who is the former CIA chief and who is now Secretary of State. Now Mike Pompeo, on the 17th of October 2017, made the following statement, public statement, to the effect that if Kim Jong-un suddenly dies and disappears, don't ask me any questions given CIA history. <laughs> Okay, and then, and then he said, uh, essentially what he said, I, I don't have the exact quote here, and it, it's recorded that in this statement he confirms that Kim Jong-un is on the assassination list of, of the CIA. Okay, he said, well, you know, if he gets shot, don't ask me any questions, he's on the CIA list. You can check the exact uh, quotation. It's on one of my articles, the recent articles on, on Korea. But what you have there is an individual. You can't appoint an individual like that um, to uh, establish a peace agreement. And now the latest proposal that has come from Pompeo where he, was, he went to Pyongyang what is it, a couple of weeks ago. Okay? He was in Pyongyang a couple of weeks ago. And uh, they, um, they said that these were gangster-like the North Korean uh, authorities. Uh, once he had left, they said it was, these were gangster-like proposals. Um, and they expressed their uh, their dissent with uh, the whole attitude that, that Pompeo had, while ultimately also endorsing the spirit of Singapore. Okay? Now, the, what this means is the United States is still um, threatening North Korea with what is called the bloody nose, the bloody nose operation. The bloody nose operation is the more usable um, tactical nuclear weapon. Because bloody nose, if you give you a punch in the nose, you don't die. That's exactly the concept in the, the mini nuke, safe for the surrounding civilian population. And, and uh, in other words, they have persistently considered the use of tactical nuclear weapons against North Korea. A conventional war is, is, is inconceivable. So it would be a, uh, a strike of that nature, or it could be a conventional strike, but they are still in the logic of the war games, uh, the, the punitive, preemptive action against North Korea. And then what, um, what Pompeo presented to the North Korean authorities was to adopt the Vietnam solution. Now, the Vietnam solution was uh, reached in 1993, and essentially, I, I went to Vietnam twice during that period. It's it's in my book, but essentially, what they did is that they uh, they lifted the embargo. That those are the conditions imposed on Vietnam. They lifted the embargo on the condition that Vietnam adopt the neoliberal agenda, uh, but also they required that Vietnam pay war reparations to the United States. 
that's not known to many people. They, uh, well, essentially they said, you pay the bad debts of the Saigon regime. Now, the, those bad debts of the Saigon regime were the debts incurred through the shipment of weapons and so on and so forth that they owed the United States, which was tantamount to war reparations to the, to the people who committed the war crimes. Okay? Now, that, uh, of course, I don't think that Pompeo has any understanding of what happened in, in, uh, in Vietnam, other than the fact that the U.S. led a, a, a criminal uh, and illegal war against uh, an entire nation. But the, the arrogance, I mean, the North Koreans are not dumbbells. They, 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 they know what happened in Vietnam. And uh, they fought to... They rebuilt, now they rebuilt their whole society and so on, uh, wiped to the ground in, 19, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the 1950s. Um, the irony today, and I, I should mention this, I'll conclude on that. Um, I've looked at the social indicators for North Korea. The literacy rate is 99%. It's only 83% in the United States of America. There's universal health coverage. Uh, and uh, the, the um, head of the World Health Organization, which I don't particularly like, but she nonetheless, Margaret Chan, okay, she's Chinese from Hong Kong, she said that this is one of the best healthcare systems in the developing world, okay? And has a better coverage, than certainly has a better coverage than what, they, what the United States provides to its own citizens, which is private medicine, essentially. Uh, and uh, then uh, I think uh, you should look at some of the pictures of what Pyongyang looks like today, okay? Because the images that we are used to, to hearing about is some kind of undeveloped uh, uh, third world country which doesn't have an infrastructure. No, the, 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 I think, and then I, I looked at that and I compared it to the tower, the Trump Tower came. Okay? <laughs> but the, this is a modern city with, uh, with uh, skyscrapers, uh, uh, scientific, uh, um, you know, scientific and technological infrastructure, um, and uh, they don't have many motor vehicles, but they have they have an urban landscape, uh, which which in many regards competes with with what we see in, in other Asian cities, and uh, I think that this in many regards is a is a bit of a slap in the face that that this society. Which, which lost a large share of its population, and its whole, uh, all its cities were destroyed, has managed to rebuild despite the sanctions, despite the threats and the sanctions over, over the last, uh, you know, over the last 70 uh, years or so. Uh, and uh, they, whether we like that regime or not, that's not the issue. Uh, they developed their nuclear weapons program after having been threatened with nuclear weapons for more than half a century. And I should mention that South Korea was also a nuclear weapons state during a long period. And the United States had nuclear weapons facilities in South Korea. Okay? That's very important. So it's not something which they developed overnight. They developed it rather recently um, from the early 21st century, and uh, it is in response to the persistent threat of nuclear war by the United States, uh, as well as, well, I should mention, they have, a, the United States has a defense cooperation agreement with uh, South Korea, which puts all South Korean forces under, uh, under U.S. command. So that, that is the the very much the, the nature of these war games is that the South Korean President Moon cannot withdraw because it's stated that in times of war, but they are in times of war because the armistice agreement of 1953 was never, is still there. So in times of war, they cannot, 
all comes under the command of a three-star general who is, who is based in, in, uh, in South Korea. And uh, the irony is that this deployment, uh, which is annual, and it threatens North Korea, and of course, uh, both sides are at, at odds with one another, um, this is something which the inter-Korean dialogue has addressed. And, and the precondition would be for the repeal of the, of the Joint Forces Command between the United States and the Republic of Korea. Uh, but there's another dimension, that if in case of any kind of nuclear war, whether it's tactical or otherwise, directed against punitive bombing, directed against North Korea, this would engulf the entire peninsula. The, the, the Koreans know that because, uh, you know, the distance between uh, the, the distance between downtown Seoul and the, and the border is 22 kilometers, okay? It's like going from PJ to Kuala Lumpur, okay? It's, it's, it's virtually, it's, it's less than an hour's drive. It's like going from Manhattan to New Jersey for people who have been to New York City, okay? So that the, the distances are so short that if you attack North Korea with a nuclear weapon, you essentially commit harakiri. The whole, the whole peninsula explodes. Uh, and um, the problem is you have people like Trump don't have much notion of geography. Okay? So where, where is North Korea? No, somewhere in the map there. You know? the, these are not very educated people. They're figureheads. And, and I, I, I don't think that Trump has, given, has looked at a map to see how close everything is, you know. You're bombing New Jersey out of New York or something. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I've verified the distance. It's 22 kilometers. And, and that's about what, that's sort of a suburban, I live 40 kilometers from the center of Montreal, 45 kilometers. And I, I commute every day. So it, it takes a bit more than half an hour if there's no traffic. <laughs> there you are. You can, and and, and so uh, inevitably, uh, the the ignorance of the decision makers is also uh, an element, a fundamental element. And people in the military are not always very educated, um, and they don't necessarily um, consult the technical features of the weapons that they're going to use. And those, if those technical features are manipulated to serve a, a political agenda, they will, and they will obey, because that's the whole nature of, of military decision making. So we are indeed at a very dangerous crossroads. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not optimistic with regard to these negotiations, but I think there has been a certainly uh, um, uh, what is very positive in, in, in Korea is that the South Koreans now uh, are, and the North Koreans are working together. And, um, and I think the, the next step will be uh, the inter-Korean dialogue could possibly substitute for, uh, you know, for uh, an agreement between the United States and North Korea. It, we, ultimately, we have to repeal the Armistice Agreement of 1953. That is absolutely fundamental. Uh, so, uh, uh, my apologies for mixing up these various dimensions, but often uh, the realities are so complex. Uh, but I, I think, first of all, the history of nuclear war is completely uh, biased. It's not a Cold War phenomenon. It is a World War II phenomenon, and um, and that uh, the notion of hegemony of the United States dates back to 1939 and 1942, using the nuclear weapons to as a means of of dominating the world ultimately, uh, and that. Uh, of course, that now has reached 
a level of uh, a diabolical level where we have so many other nuclear weapons powers in the world, uh, including Israel, and uh, the, the understanding of what's going on has to be has to prevail because otherwise uh, we can't rely on 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 the. The people in high office, most of whom are war criminals, to uh, to take on a, a positive perspective. Now we have to wait uh, to get reports from the summit uh, in Helsinki, which I I think uh, ongoing today. Um, I wouldn't be too optimistic, but <laughs> it's certainly a, a step forward. Um, Thank you very much for, for your hospitality and I, I look forward to, to a sort of more direct discussion of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.